Welcome back to the series where I'm building a 6502 microprocessor out of TTL logic and some memory based on Benita's SAP1. This is Load Runner from the Apple II, which was one of its most popular games. Here it's running on an emulator for the 6502 machine that I'm building, which means that the microcode's starting to look pretty robust. This is a block diagram of the SAP-1, which originally came from Albert Paul Malvino, but Ben added a couple of extra instructions. This is the machine we're building, and in the first part we concentrate on the W bus and the register bank, which are actually built in an integrated manner. In this design, the W bus actually forms underneath all of these register chips. In the last video, we moved on to the sequencer controller, and we're going to spend a bit more time on it in this video. I previously said that I was going to add some muscle to the SAP-1. Now, you might be wondering why I chose Jesse Ventura for the sequencer controller. I have to admit that the WWF was a bit of a guilty pleasure back in the 80s and 90s. And yes, I know it's not real. If it were, they'd probably kill or seriously injure each other. Well, more often anyway. But I think Jesse was actually a better heel announcer than he was wrestler. Everyone loved to hate him which somehow reminds me of the sequencer controller. More on Jesse Ventura a bit later. The sequencer goes through a number of steps to coordinate the movement of data through the machine, and its job is much like that of the puppeteer, pulling on the right strings at the right time to get the machine to do what it wants. Here we can see it reading a value from memory, storing it in the A register and presenting it to the ALU, copying the contents of the index X register into the B register and presenting that to the ALU, adding these two values together to form the sum and storing the result in the effective address A low register. Hopefully from this quick sequence you see why I call it the Puppet Master. It pulls on a bunch of strings to make the puppet do what it wants. The puppet in this case being the machine. Once you understand that, you might be thinking, where does this instruction come from? Well, for a von Neumann architecture like the SAP1 and 6502, all of the instructions are stored in main memory. Which begs the question, how do the instructions get from main memory to the sequencer controller? To clarify how this works, first let me just quickly remove the ALU from our diagram for the moment, and I'm going to replace it with the instruction register. The input to the instruction register comes from the W bus, but its output goes directly to the address pins on the EEPROM in the sequencer controller. In step 0, we enable the static RAM and its buffer for reading. We clock the instruction register at the same time. This has the effect of transferring the instruction from the memory to the instruction register. And because of the way I've wired it, the instruction is instantly presented to the sequencer controller. There's a little bit more to the story which involves the program counter, and I'll be going over that in a later video. For now, let's look at the instruction register in a bit more detail. Here's the instruction register in the SAP1. From the schematic, we see that it takes 8 bits from the W bus. It stores the information in two 4 bit registers to form an 8 bit register. Clocking information into the instruction register is controlled by this II bar signal. The output of the instruction register goes directly to the address pins of some of the ROMs inside the sequencer controller. Benita's SAP1 design includes this feedback pathway that I'm not going to have in the SAP6502. When the I.O. bar signal is low, the output of the instruction register is presented to the W bus via this 245 buffer. Ben does this because in his design, the instruction register also acts as an effective address register, where address is held in the lower four bits, and transferred to the memory address register when it's needed. In the 6502 though, the address is never held in the same byte as the instruction, and because of all the address modes, we need four 8-bit registers to calculate the effective address. I'll be going over the 6502 addressing modes in the microcode videos later in the series, but in case you want to familiarise yourself with the main concepts, I've linked these videos below. At this stage, I think the first part of these videos is probably most useful. For the instruction register in this build, I'm planning to use the 74HC373. This is an octal D-type latch rather than an octal D-type flip-flop. Benita has a great video on D-type latches, and I'll link it above. Now to be completely honest, I don't use this chip that much, 
In fact, I had to go out and buy some for this build. It's pin compatible with the 74HC374, which is an Octal D-type flip-flop. So provided I put it in a socket, I can always change later. If you think you know why I used a latch here instead of a flip-flop, leave your answers below in the comments. I'll give you my reasons in the next video. In his design, Ben Eater actually uses two EE proms. When we want to connect multiple memories together to form a bigger memory, there are essentially two ways of doing it. One is to expand the data bus. This is where we connect all of the address and control signals together, but treat all the data lines as being independent. Connecting them up this way essentially gives us a 2K by 16 bit memory. This is essentially what Ben Eater has done, although I did do a little bit of trickery with A7, which I'm not going to go into here. For all intents and purposes, you can think of Ben as having ganged together two chips to give a 16 bit output. The other common way to gang memory chips together is to expand the address space. This time, we connect all of the address pins and all of the data pins of both chips together. Then we add some new address signals, only one in this case, and using some decode logic, we select only one of the chips to be on at a time. This forms a 4K by 8 bit memory. The upper chips selected for the address range 0 to 7FF, and the bottom chip selected for the address range of 800 to FFF. As a side note, the original Apple II Plus used both of these strategies. First, it expanded the data bus from 1 bit to 8 by using 8 individual chips. This formed a 16K bank. Then it expanded the address space by grouping three of these banks together to form a 48K byte memory. Why does Ben Eater need 16 lines coming out of the sequencer controller? Well, that has to do with the number of functional units on the design and the number of control signals that each functional unit requires. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Here are all the control signals, and Ben's inverted some of them. Bit 0 is the halt signal, and this is connected to the clock circuitry and just stops the machine. Many of the registers in the design actually require two signals, one to clock the input, and the other to present the data on the W bus. II, which is an active low signal, clocks the value on the W bus into the instruction register. This actually occurs on the next positive edge of clock. The I.O. signal with a bar on top of it is also active low, and this outputs the current value in the instruction register onto the W bus. We have the same set of controls for the A register. The output of the B register goes straight into the ALU, so we only need one control line to latch values into the B register. We need another control line so that the output of the ALU, or adder in this case, can be presented to the W bus. We have another control line which determines whether we do an add or a subtract, and one to update the carry and zero flags. We need to be able to latch data into the memory address register, and we need some more control signals to determine whether we read from or write to the memory. We have three individual signals for controlling the program counter, an output signal which presents the value on the W bus, a jump signal which reads the value on the W bus into the program counter, and the third signal is a count enable, which just increments the program counter by one. Last but not least, we need a way of writing into our output register. There we have it, the full set of control signal for Benita's SAP-1. The nature of the architecture of the SAP-1 dictates that we have 16 control lines. But the 6502 is a bigger machine with more registers, so we're going to need a lot more control lines. The current design has 40 control lines, so we're going to need to gang together five of these EEPROMs. Each chip has 512 kilobytes, but we only actually really require 16 kilobytes per chip, so a lot of the address pins are going to be tied to ground. Let's go ahead and build this puppy first, and then I'll explain all the signals after. The controller EEPROM address lines are connected to the W bus through the instruction register. I already connected up these inputs in the first video. Now I need to connect up the outputs from the instruction register to the address lines of the EEPROMs. I know it's a little hard to tell from underneath the board, but here's EEPROM 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
because we're looking at the underside of the board, the pinout for the chip's actually reversed. So the lower address pins are on the right-hand side of the chip rather than the left. I've been tripped up by that more than once. W bus signal zero goes to the input of flip-flop zero on the instruction register, while the output of this flip-flop goes to address line zero on all of the EPROMs. I'm using this technique where I pre-cut the shielding on the wire wrap wire, then I slide each segment into place as I need it. I've now moved on to W7. This means that there's one continuous wire from the output of the flip-flop to the very last EEPROM. There's one very important little trick you have to do to use this technique. Normally, the shielding doesn't move on the wire itself, it's too tight. But if you pre-stretch the wire without pre-stretching the shielding, then the wire just becomes slightly thinner and the shielding will move. So you need to strip one end of the wire, hold bare metal in one hand and shielded wire in the other, and just apply a little bit of tension, enough so that, say, 50 centimetres of wire expands by half a centimetre, which is 20 inches expanding by quarter an inch. Then you cut all the segments to length and slide them up and down the wire. I've also wired in parallel some of the upper address lines, and I'll connect them to their source signal later. Let's have a look at the control signals on the SAP6502. I need an instruction register load signal. This is connected to the clock signal on the octal D-type latch. The ALU on the 6502 is quite a lot more complex than the ALU on the SAP1. In addition to add and subtract, it can do AND, OR, and exclusive all logical functions. It can shift right and left, and it can do a decimal correction on the output. So after an add or a subtract, the results in binary coded decimal. The ALU requires a whopping 18 signals to control it. But remember that this includes the status register, which is tightly coupled to the ALU. I'm going to do at least two or three videos on the ALU later in the series, so don't worry about the signals too much for now. Just note that we need to leave space for them. We need some control signals for access to main memory. We need to clock the program counter, which is another two signals, one for the higher byte and one for the lower byte. We need some other ancillary signals, one for resetting the sequence counter, and one for outputting a constant to the W bus. This is a 4-bit value, which is signed extended to 8 bits. Using this, we can set all the values we need for the interrupt and reset vectors. In Ben's design, there's nothing to stop us having multiple devices writing to the W bus at once. I'm going to put in a restriction that only one device can write to the W bus, and only one device can read from the W bus at a time. I have more than a dozen registers connected to the W bus, but with this constraint, I can use two pairs of 74HC138s to form a set of 4 to 16 decoders. One decoder to control which device writes to the W bus. The other 4 to 16 decoder determines which device latches the data off the W bus. This means I only need 8 bits from my EEPROM to determine the source and the destination on the W bus, and possibly more importantly, it prevents output contention on the W bus. This is actually quite a common modification for the SAP1. We can see the sequencer controller starting to take form here. The data signals from the EEPROM drive some 138s, and the output of these clock the various registers around the machine. But there's a problem with this design. There can be quite a delay between the address line settling and data being presented on the output pins. This delay can be up to 100 nanoseconds for the chips I'm using in this build. In that 100 nanoseconds, quite literally anything could be on the data lines. This could lead to spurious clock signals and the data in the registers being corrupted. Let's say the value in the upper four signals happened to float to the value of 5. Then our EBH register will receive an unwanted clock signal. To solve this, we need some extra D-type flip-flops on the output of our 138s. We arrange it so that these signals have settled by the time we apply the clock to the 574. This will prevent any spurious clock signals from floating data lines, but it does add a little bit of complexity when writing the microcode. We have a similar hardware setup for all the output enable signals as well. To keep all these signals aligned, I'm going to add these D-type flip-flops to the lower four bits as well. It's probably actually less critical that I do this, 
but it'll be almost impossible to write the microcode if the source and destination for a transaction need to be specified in two different steps within the microcode. Maybe not impossible, but unnecessarily hard. This is our general design for the sequencing controller, and let's add in the instruction register. There are some other devices that control the address lines on the EEPROMs, but I'll load them in a bit later. For now, I want to build this bank of decoders with their output flip-flops. I'm looking at the underneath side of the board, and I've already sold in place all the chips. The bank of EEPROMs is just off the bottom of the screen. This is a 74HC574, and this is a 74HC138 that drives it. You can already see some of the connections between these two chips. We have another pair directly beneath them, so this is 16 outputs so far. This is replicated off to the right, giving us a total of 32 outputs. I've arranged it so that most of the outputs of the 138 are directly adjacent to their associated input on the 574. This just makes wiring so much easier. A little bit of pre-planning can really make a big difference in a wiring job like this. In fact, it's the main reason I switched from using 74HC374s to using 74HC574s. Nearly done, and you can see the top of the EEPROMs in this shot here. Now that I've connected all the outputs from the 138s, I need to connect up the inputs to EEPROM0. Remember that two 138s will have the same three inputs, but the fourth address line is connected up to output enable signals. On one of them, it needs to be connected to an active low output enable, while on the other 138, it needs to be connected to an active high output enable. This makes the two 138s act as a 4 to 16 decoder. If you'll remember back, this is what we did in the last video to make a 4 to 16 decoder on the breadboard. This lower 4 to 16 converter generates all the clock signals for the devices connected to the W bus, while this upper one generates all the output enable signals. Next, I'm going to wire in three of these 574s. I'm going to locate the remaining 574 in the ALU itself. I've already wired up EEPROM 2 and EEPROM 3. I'm down to the last two wires on EEPROM 4. Ideally, I should have used zero insertion force sockets for these EEPROMs, or ZIFs, but they take up a lot of board space, and I want to keep the design limited to one of these perf boards. I just need to make sure the microcode's good before I burn it into the EEPROMs. Well, that's a wrap for this video. There'll be one more video on the sequencer, then we'll move on to the program counter. So why did I choose Jesse Ventura for the sequencer controller? Well, apart from being a wrestler, he was a Navy SEAL, a groundbreaking commentator, actor, author, and the 38th governor of Minnesota. He mightn't be as well known as his glamorous friend over there on the ALU, but he's good at doing many different things, just like the sequencer controller. That's how come if I run for president, if they let me in the debates, I'd win that too. Bold talk, isn't it? On a final note, hopefully you can see that the SAP-1 sequencer controller is just a smaller version of the SAP-6502 sequencer controller. If you can understand one, you should be able to understand the other. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and leaving comments really helps the channel. I'll try to answer every question.